thinking in to improve profitability, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance sustainability of livestock and crop production systems under a changing climate. Warwick has significant experience in investigating soil carbon under grazing systems, led the Central New South Wales component of the National Soil Carbon Research Project and helped develop the first pilot pricing scheme for soil carbon in Australia. And uh, we'll let Warwick go on with his topic. No worries, thanks, Jeff. Um, just, oop, hang on. Okay. Um, look, today I'm going to just give you a bit of an update from a livestock perspective about really what we should be doing to prepare for what's coming in this uh, low carbon economy. So. Uh, I think this is a challenging one because at the moment there's been a big focus on um, reducing emissions from electricity and transport. Um, agriculture's sort of had a bit and, and mainly been promoted as a way to offset emissions from the other industries, but particularly once we start making large scale gains in those other industries, it's going to be uh, a bigger focus on agriculture. And what my aim is today is to really tell you some of the main drivers and to, I guess, give you some basics about what you can do to prepare for what's coming. Um, so first I wanted to start with sort of some background about like what, where this has all come from and um, particularly when you've, you hear about uh, net zero, um, it, all of that really started with the um, uh, Paris COP agreement to keep global warming below two degrees and so once that agreement was made, that's really locked in um, this uh, net zero target. And so these net zero targets have now been adopted by every state in Australia and the federal government. Um, and what that means is that by 2050, we have to have our emissions um, so at zero, basically. And that doesn't, that's our net emissions. That doesn't mean that we remove all emissions and particularly something like methane in agriculture is going to be a really hard one to remove. So it's not expected that that's going to be zero, but it means that we've got ways of taking carbon out of the atmosphere to uh, offset some of those emissions that, we, that, that are hard to, to mitigate uh, or remove. So what are the Australian targets? So we know uh, net zero by 2050, but as part of that target, we've got this 43% reduction below 2005 levels by 2030. So that's coming round very quickly. Um, and this is sort of where we're starting to head towards. So we, we, we need to start making sort of some rapid gains in that area. Um, so currently we've made about a 25% reduction in that target. So we've, we've, got, we've made good progress and that's been um, some of the land use um, change uh, moves to renewables have, have helped with that, um, but there's still a long way to go. And, and the reason I want to say that is there's going to be big changes that are going to impact in the industry and agriculture is, is not going to be immune to those changes. We are going to actually, it, it will impact all of us in the way that we operate. Um, so just starting with this, um, methane is the big problem for uh, agricultural emissions. So it, enteric methane makes up 70% of our agricultural emissions. Um, and so, uh, and, and that's part of a byproduct of, of digestion uh, in ruminants. Um, and it is also seen as a little bit of an inefficiency because it's energy lost out of those ruminants. So every time we've got uh, methane lost from those animals, we're actually um, uh, losing energy out of those animals as well. So. There is actually some efficiency gains if we could overcome this problem, but there's like millions of years of evolution that have come to, to, to uh, evolve these animals this way. We're not going to reverse that overnight. These, these are not easy problems to change. The other real um, challenge that we've got is that 96% of our sheep and cattle are grazed on pastures or, or, or grazed. So, while there's been a lot of promotion of things like supplements to address these problems, when you look at where they're going to be used, it's mainly going to be in intensive industries and feedlots where we can get those be used efficiently with mixed rations. Once we start trying to use those currently in, in graze systems, they're very inefficient and unlikely to be 
are part of this solution alone. So grazing makes this uh, a much harder challenge that we need to address. Um, and as I've mentioned, we, we will have to make some reductions, but it's not expected that methane will be at zero. So uh, the methane pledge is probably our best guide of, of where we, we need to get to with, with these reductions. And that's about 30% by 2030 and 47% by 2050. Um, that's going to be really hard to, to do. At the moment, our methane output is very strongly linked with our per head production. So we actually haven't decoupled that production and, and emissions yet. And so uh, without using offsets. And so there's, there's a real, we've got a real challenge here to try and achieve this. So this is not, um, this is not going to be an easy problem uh, to, to overcome and that's why there's going to be a real focus to try and address some of these things. But we do have way forward. Um, just a bit more of a background. Um, our, on, on top of methane emissions, we've got some other um, uh, greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide is one of the other key ones, which is mainly in cropping systems and associated with nitrogen loss in cropping systems. Uh, and this figure here just gives us a bit of a background, um, an idea of what the global warming potential uh, is over a hundred year period. And then uh, we, ha that we have to normalise these numbers over that period because they have different lifetimes in the atmosphere. And one of the advantages about methane is if we can actually reduce it, it's got a relatively short period in the, the, um, in the atmosphere, so it can come down relatively quickly if we start to take action. Um, one of the key things when understanding uh, emissions and particularly what we're going to be need to do in the future is um, this term called um, emissions intensity or greenhouse gas emissions intensity. Um, that is the amount of greenhouse gas per tonne of commodity that you produce. So this is going to be really important um, around the supply chain side of, of um, your businesses where we think there's going to be a lot of action. So um, this is where, and there's two sides of this equation, so it's not all about reducing emissions, which can either be come from avoiding those emissions um, or sequestering and, and offsetting them. Um, there's also the production side of this. And so one of the things we have to be really careful is when we're looking at the emissions avoidance that we're not damaging the production side of our businesses. Because by doing that, and um, we, we're really looking at, at things that actually maintain that productivity and are much more greenhouse gas efficient than, um, because we can have uh, systems that, that um, will impact on both sides of that equation. So it's really important that greenhouse gas intensity is probably going to be the main metric that you're judged by in the future. Um, I, I wanted to specifically talk about the supply chains because this is how, while a lot of the policies that government make will impact the sort of where we're headed with this, it's actually the pledges that the corporations are setting that is probably going to impact you uh, uh, more because uh, these are the companies that actually you're selling your products to and they're making large pledges about reducing emissions. And so um, since 2019, the top 50 companies set to implement net zero strategies has risen from approximately 30 to about 90%. So most companies are setting these, these targets. Often they've done at a very high level using uh, relatively simple approaches and they they're not built from the bottom up, so they don't know how they're going to achieve those emissions intensive, uh, savings at the bottom level. Um, the other mechanism around this is something called the Climate Related Financial Disclosure. So it's a global initiative, but it's driven by investors. So this is the investors keeping themselves, uh, the companies um, honest about the pledges that they've made. And so this is where a lot of the action, so they actually have to make um, they have to make uh, progress against these, these pledges that they're making. And so while you're not part of their direct emissions, uh, what you'll call what uh, scope three emissions, so they're emissions that are actually accounted against those companies. So there will be, and this is the incentive that they've got to work with you to help farmers reduce emissions. So just very simply, um, that emissions intensity is, is commonly called a, um, a, a, the metric used to measure your farm footprint. Um, and I just wanted to go through what makes up that farm footprint. So if we start on the, 
Uh, in the centre there, we've got our greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with the production of your products. Um, so I've already mentioned uh, methane, which is one of the main ones, but we, uh, we've got nitrous oxide um, from our fertilisers and residues. We've also got CO2 from lime, um, uh, your reuse and energy. Um, then once you've calculated those emissions at a paddock or a farm scale, then you can look at any offsets that you might then have on your farm. And so that's the trees that you've planted since 2005, so the tree lots or, or, or um, farm forestry, um, or soil carbon that you've documented that can be built on your farm to offset those emissions. Um, the other one that's important there is the scope three emissions. And so these are the emissions that are um, upstream from your farm. So they're the products that you bring onto your farm uh, and they still count against your footprint. So while you don't directly have control of those, um, they're the things like the fertiliser that you use, the, the ag chem products, uh, and if you're trading livestock, the emissions that are associated with those livestock that are actually being bought onto your property. Um, so what are some of those footprints? Um, so this is just for some of the, the major uh, industries. Um, uh, sheep, uh, what I've got here is, is rangeland beef, but if we look at most beef production, it's in this same range. And again, when we look at what makes up these different levels of uh, emissions uh, for our cattle, uh, enteric methane is, is the largest one. For sheep production, it's about the same. We find that it's somewhere in, uh, in the mid-90s, the enteric methane makes up for uh, these production systems. So when we're looking at what to do on farm to avoid these emissions, enteric methane is sort of one, two and three that we need to be working on. Um, the other thing that you'll probably notice here is grain production has a significantly lower footprint per tonne of product than, than methane and that makes it a, probably a much smaller foot, uh, target initially. Um, but And it's got a much different um, a source of emissions and so there's a large amount of that uh, emissions that are scope three that come from the fertiliser production. Um, lime is also part of that as well. So once we start moving to different enterprises on farm, this is just some Victorian data that shows uh, the average versus the top 20% of um, benchmark data here and what the uh, emissions are for different enterprises. Um, and as you can see, things like merino breeding is, has got a bit more in there than um, prime lambs. Cow calves can have a, quite a lot. Steer trading is relatively low, but that value doesn't take into those scope three emissions. So the cows that have been used to breed those, those calves that have, or, or steers that have actually come onto the, the property. Um, and again, dairy is around nine, 10. Interestingly, on a um, per tonne of product basis, there's not a lot of difference um, between the, the top and, and the bottom because it's, it's really about the dry matter in, input that goes down the throat of the animals. And again, when you take these out to a per hectare basis, um, the average is generally a little bit lower than the top producers because the top producers actually have a higher production per hectare um, than the, the average. And so they can often have a little bit higher production per hectare. And it, it often evens out these um, differences between enterprises because that stocking rate is sort of normalised across the different, um, different enterprises. So what have we got? What are our options to try and reduce these? Um, these are some of the, the, the things that, that we might want to, to look at. So we've got some supplements. The main ones that uh, are coming through is something called 3NOP, 3NOP, um, or asparagopsis, which you all would have heard about, which is the seaweed one. And they've done a fantastic job from a marketing perspective because uh, even my kids come home and tell me that seaweed's going to solve this problem. Um, We've got things like herd efficiency, um, so that's increasing your sale weight or your reproductive rate, um, and we've got other things like uh, any methanogenic pastures. Then we've got things on the uh, uh, sequestration side, so we've got revegetation and soil carbon sequestration. But when we're looking at this from, uh, I guess, uh, how you, we should be approaching this, um, these uh, avoidance options are your lower risk options. 
And the reason for that is once you've avoided a mission, you never have to worry about it again. It's in the past. If you sequ uh, use sequestration to offset an emission in the current year, then you're actually locking in that you're going to remove that carbon to offset that emission for, for permanently into the future. And while we have schemes that, that sort of discount that over 25 years or 100 years, um, we've still got a lot of risk associated with in a, in, a, in a changing climate that we can actually store that carbon into the future. And I'll go into like some of the, uh, an example of that in a bit later in this talk. Um, so with enteric methane, um, some of the, the things that are associated with it, um, I think this graph on the right really um, shows and tells a story. It's, it's really all associated with dry matter intake. And so with the amount of feed that's brought in, there is about 20.7 grams, uh, for every kilogram that's, that's taken in, you get about 27.7 grams of methane output. Um, and that's a very hard relationship to break. Um, so what we're looking for is things that can drive down that curve this way. Um, and so some of the things that can do that is the quality of the forage and actually uh, feeding grain, which has a high propi uh, proportion. Um, room and pH, also um, more acid equals less methane. And then really what we've been focusing on is the bottom of this is what are the secondary compounds that we can use in a supplement or in some of our forages that can help to reduce this methane. Um, so this is just uh, a review that looked at all of those major supplements that, or, or, or secondary compounds that are in supplements to look at the average reduction from those supplements. And macroalgae, which is your asparagopsis, is the big one that, that has the biggest effect. So that, on average, that's about a 45% reduction uh, across all the studies that have been done on that um, compared to a control. The 3-NOP has also had a good effect. Uh, and that is also additive on top of the oils, which has a smaller effect. The problem with macroalgae and 3-NOP is to get really efficient use, and you can get efficiencies up around 90% with those products, but it has to be evenly mixed with the feeds so that every mouthful that is taken with those animals actually has those products in it. And when you're thinking about how we supplement under extensive grazing, those animals might not get supplements for days uh, on end. And so they're just going to get a limited amount of those products to be able to be active and actually reduce the methane. Yep. Um, so one of the ones that we're really focusing in on is low methane pastures. So we, we know that a lot of our common um, pasture varieties have some of these plant secondary compounds in them. And some of those can actually have uh, a relatively high um, potential to reduce methane. Um, so we did a, um, a review of this recently and the top four of those I've, I've put up here, Bicerula is, is one that has shown really high levels of reduction in, in, um, in uh, in vitro studies. Lotus, um, which is Birdsfoot's trefoil, Sulla, Plantain, and the next one on that list is, is Chicory, which is very similar to Plantain. So these are the species that we're starting to focus in on and how can we put together a pasture mixture that you might be able to use that can reduce methane but still have a really um, high level of um, productivity. And this is sort of on the, the left is what... The, the steps we really have to go through to make sure that happens. We have to understand its reduction potential, make sure that that agronomic suitability is there so it persists. Um, ensure that we're getting animal production, or at least the same animal production that we're currently getting off it, um, and then do that systems level understanding to make sure that we're not getting changes in other greenhouse gases. So just a summary of those avoidance options. Uh, what, what, should, what can you do now? Because there's currently really no carbon price that, that's impacting on your business, the only thing that incentive you've got is things that, he, that are actually going to have a positive impact on your business. And the things that you can do now are, are those efficiency things. So things like supplementary feeding at the right times, um, maintaining animal health, improving animal fertility, they're all going to have business benefits for you, good for your bottom line, and they improve the efficiency and re reduce your methane intensity. So they're all things that you can do now. 
The next set is the stuff that's sort of products that are available, but one of the main things that's holding these back is actually the accounting so that we can have confidence of, of how much reduction has actually occurred with these. And they're things like 3 and OP, some of the other supplements like oils, tannins, uh, grape bark, uh, legumes in the system, particularly in Northern Australia where there's currently not many legumes, and breeding is a good one where we know we get about 1% gain per year um, and we're, we've got some work going on developing EBVs for cattle and sheep to, uh, for methane at the moment. And then after 10 years, we've got some other things that might come online. So once we've got a greater understanding of those secondary compounds in plants, there's likely to be other products or, or species under development and, and some of those are looking at genetically engineered pastures, uh, vaccines. Asparagopsis, realistically, is probably 10 years away because of the cost um, and some of the, um, of the animal health uh, issues that are associated with it. And one of the ones that we're really interested in is something called early life programming. And this is where you would feed something like three knot to um, your calves that, that are getting weaned. Um, and that actually imprints a lower methane emissions for the life of those animals. So that's been uh, proven in, a, in, in one study so far, so it's, it's something that we've got to work more on. So there's plenty of things going on that, that, are, that um, are likely to, to, to come together. And, and it's not going to be one of these, it's going to be a whole heap of things that you need to put together to make this work. Um, I'm just going to quickly switch across to soil carbon to touch on that sequestration side. And just what I'm going to do is to point out a few key um, principle or, or issues with soil carbon that you may not be currently aware of when you're considering these projects. Um, the first one is that um, so all, all your soils have a, uh, an upper limit of sequestration that is driven by the soil texture you have and the environment or the climate that you're growing in. So this is called an equilibrium level. Um, this is data from Rothamsted in, the, in England, but uh, the same principles apply for Australia, where we have initially a sort of relatively uh, quick build-up. Uh, then over time, that gradually uh, reduces as the law of diminishing returns we get. We need to put the same amount of biomass in to get less and less carbon gain. Um, and what happens is if we change that management back to what we had, then our carbon, which is the dark blue, it reverts back down to the, the standard practice. So one of the things with soil carbon is you need to change practice to something that puts more biomass in and retains more biomass in the soil or carbon in the soil. Uh, and then you need to maintain that, that at the same level uh, into, uh, uh, into the future or otherwise your, your soil carbon will drop. The other problem we've got with soil carbon is we've got a lot of natural variability in Australia that actually impacts our ability to and mass that equilibrium level. So this is some data from a long-term trial at Condoblin uh, where we had initially 12 years of build-up in soil carbon. Um, by the end of that 12-year period we had a benefit um, in soil carbon so that's the um, perennial pasture was higher than some other cropping systems. Um, but what we found was over a three-year period after that, we actually lost all that soil carbon that was gained over that 12-year period. And one of, but um, part of that is we, we still had the soil carbon benefit that was at the top was still there at the bottom. And so one of the challenges we've got with the current methods is we are measuring soil carbon over, chain, uh, over time, so we're taking into account this natural variability that goes up and down. Uh, we've monitored this phenomenon now in three separate sites, so it's not a unique phenomenon to this data set. It's actually, we find it to be pretty consistent, um, where there is this temporal difference that's associated with environment and, and other impacts. But good management does have a benefit, it's just much smaller than what you might get over those um, longer term environmental um, variation. And so, and this is sort of one of the problems with the ACUs that, that have currently been measured in uh, and awarded in the, in the current good season, that seasonal influence is likely to be part of that response. So just what uh, what land management is associated with high levels of change. This is just some of the things that we do have data for. Um, conversion from crop to pasture, uh, additional nutrients, um, adds about half a tonne of carbon per hectare per year over 20 years. 
Grazing management's often been promoted, but we recently reviewed this and on average there's, there's no difference across all the studies, long-term studies that have been done in Australia. But where you actually, and that's because there's a lot of variability. Uh, once you drill down into some, a few well-run well studies with good data, you, we actually find that there is a small benefit from that, but no, nowhere near the massive benefit that's probably been promoted. So in summary, um, the first thing you need to do is know your emissions before making decisions about carbon. Know your number. Um, there's benchmarks starting to develop about w what's good and what's bad for a different um, for a beef production enterprise, for a wool production enterprise, uh, land production enterprise. So you can then start to understand where you are. And if you're high, then, then you can start to look at ways to reduce that uh, or offset that. Um, plan for the opportunities that will arise through supply chain reporting. So there's likely to be market access issues that will come up in the future. So you're not likely to get paid a whole heap if you're doing a good job here. You'll just get access to more markets that will probably be of a higher value. Um, things that you can do now is uh, associated with a livestock efficiency and they're the things that are going to benefit your business and you don't need a carbon price to, to, to drive it. Um, and, and finally, prioritise that avoidance um, over sequestration just because it's lower risk in the long run. So I'll pull it up there. Very good. Thank you, Warwick. So um, Warwick, we'll be back after the break um, in our Q&A session.